This is the 20th lecture for MA 1012 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we're going to think about applications of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Consider a simple model of the development of two populations, what we'll call a predator-prey model. Um, this is a simple uh, idea that we're going to try and keep track of an owl population owls at month k. So we'll measure time in months and the months will be 1, 2, 3 and so on starting from some initial month. So the owls at month k should be given by number ok and the, uh, and the rats at uh, month k are uh, rk. Now um, the idea being basically more or less that Principally, owls are eating rats, and rats are principally eaten by owls. So if we imagine a simple model in which they're basically related to one another, we'd imagine that if we have a very large number of owls, they'll eat lots of rats, the rat population should go down. And on the other hand, if a very large rat population, owls will eat them, and their rat owl population will go up. So um, so we look at it, uh, a simple model of it. Imagine we've gone out and we've measured roughly how the populations vary from month to month. We found that the next month's owl population is approximately 0.5 times the current one. That looks bad. Looks like they're all going to die off. But uh, it's got a 0.4 times the, the rat population. So this month we measure rats and owls and we find that next month it's given by approximately by this. And when I say approximately, of course, what we do is we'd go out and measure several years worth of data. Um, very famous example in Canada, the lynx and hare populations are actually measured over hundreds of years by the by the um, uh, Hudson's Bay Company. So we have lots of data uh, in some cases. So, um, so we imagine we have this, which means that uh, we have some relationship between next month's owls and rats and this month's owls and rats uh, as measured. And we'll take uh, this guy to be minus uh, 0.104 owls and plus 1.1 rats. Let's take another look at that and see what, what, what does it make us think of. How is this working? So what we're saying is that if there were, for example, no rats at a given month, then, of course, there, that what we'd expect is that um, that would mean that the file population, they'd starve, and there'd be half as many of them in the next month. So there's a natural tendency towards starving off of the owls. But what keeps the owls going is that there are rats to eat. Um, this is, uh, on the other hand, saying that if there were no owls, we'd expect next month, no owls, we'd expect that the rat population would just start to increase. Because they're not eating owls, they're eating something else. We aren't, we aren't including what they're eating into the model. So somehow there's a natural tendency of rats to have an explosive growth in population unless it's held back by owls. And a natural tendency of owls to die off unless they have something to eat, some rats to eat. Now, um, this means we can organize this as a matrix. Next month's data, in terms of last month's data, has a linear transformation of last month's data. We could put this into a vector, O k plus 1, R k plus 1, uh, next uh, month's vector, um, is going to be a matrix of numbers. These numbers here, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, minus 0 0.014, and point at uh, one point one times last month's owl and rat data. So we get a matrix here. So we can think of this as being a matrix which we'll call A. And if we want to understand the long-term behavior of the population, so how do we do that? Well, every time we go from one month to the next, we multiply by this matrix. So if we want to go a large number of months, we want to multiply by this matrix a large number of times. And so naturally, the way to deal with large numbers of linear transformations of data is to treat the linear transformation, the matrix, as having some basis of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. If we could find a basis of eigenvectors for it, we could find the eigenvalues for those, then we'd understand how to, how to take large powers very easily. I don't want to go back through the details of how you calculate out the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Recall that we calculate eigen values, I'll just do a little bit of it, uh, we calculate eigenvalues by plugging an unknown uh, lambda in here, an abstract variable, and computing out this determinant. So again, that's the determinant we get by taking the matrix itself, A, 
the original matrix and uh, and then subtracting lambdas from its diagonal entries, computing out that 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 determinant, which for a two by two you can do just using the usual little formula for this times this minus that times that formula for a determinant of a two by two. For a larger dimensional matrices, you'd have to work much harder to calculate out the eigenvalues, and uh, you you then find so equals da 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 dot. Uh, you'd find that in fact the eigenvalues uh, can be calculated out explicitly, and they are. Um, let's say, let's call them lambda, is lambda 1 is 1.02, and another eigenvalue, lambda 2, lambda is lambda 2, is 0.58. Um, they have corresponding eigenvectors, let's call them y1 is uh, 10, 13, and y2 is 5, 1. Now, calculating out those eigenvectors really requires quite a bit of linear algebra. As we said before, you'd plug the eigenvalues, this lambda 1 and this lambda 2, those are the roots of this characteristic polynomial. You plug them back in into a minus lambda identity. So I'd take a minus 1.02 identity, and I'd take a minus 0.58 identity. I'd calculate out their a basis for the solutions of that linear equation, the linear equation being uh, a minus lambda 1 identity y equals 0, then you find that y1 is a solution and that every solution is just a multiple of that y1, that it spans the solutions. And similarly, you'd here calculate a minus lambda 2 identity y equals 0, write out that system of linear equations, calculate out the solutions, and find that all the solutions are just multiples of this one particular solution. So that's how we even find the y1 and the y2, by solving those linear systems, and we come up with that, and that is the solution up to rescalings. So what does it tell us, though, about the long-term dynamics? Well, there are two eigenvalues. One is close to 1, which means the population stays close to being always the same. Um, it so uh, at a particular at that particular population, ten owls, thirteen rats. What happens next month is it's almost the same population, but multiplied by uh, 1.02. In other words, it's a two percent increase in the in the in the uh, owl and rat populations together. Both of them increase by two percent. So if you had ten owls and thirteen rats this month, the next month you'd have the same story except multiplied by a factor like this two percent increase. So you'd expect, well, instead of 10 and 13, if it was, let's say, 10,000 and 13,000 uh, owls and rats, then you'd expect it to go up by about 2% every, every month. And that's, that's one, sort of, uh, one sort of simple dynamics that could occur. The other possibility is if you had, say, 5,000 owls and 1,000 rats, or 500,000 owls, 100,000 rats, you'd expect that at the next month you'd multiply that by both those factors by about 0.58. And so you'd get a much smaller, you'd get all, about in half, well, about 60% of the, of the population of both owls and rats. They'd shrink together as a population. And so if, this hap if you had roughly this concentration, five times as many owls as rats, then over time you'd expect that every month you'd multiply by about 0.58 the numbers of owls and the numbers of rats. So they'd both go down together, and you'd shrink down to nothing. And so in particular, what we find is that if you have some, uh, some number of owls and, let's say, initial owls and initial rats, um, uh, then you write x somehow as that number of nows and rats put together as a vector is some amount of y1 plus some amount of y2. How do you find those amounts? That's linear algebra. You'd use some linear uh, system to figure out how to find those owls and rats. You'd write down y1, y2, and, and the and x, and you'd solve the linear, that linear system. Right There's your vertical bar to make it an augmented matrix, you'd solve and you'd find uh, the values of a1 and a2 that make this amount of this uh, amount of y1, this amount of y2 equal to x. So, uh, so I won't do that in detail. What I'm saying though is that if you had any initial amount of owls and rats, you could somehow solve this linear system to find the coefficients a1 and a2 to, sp uh, to specify that amount of owls and rats as uh, a, an expression in this basis. And in this basis, the dynamics of the system is very, very simple. What happens is this one gets multiplied by, this part gets multiplied by uh, 1.02, this by 0.58. And so if we had this, we would find, if we were to write it out explicitly, we could calculate out that um, our, so again, our x is some 
uh, number of owls, some number of rats, we wrote it out as some y1 part plus some y2 part, breaking it up into how much y1 and how much y2 are in this thing. And then we said that uh, at a large number of months later, if we wait for thousands of months, we should expect that we get multiplied large number of times, a k x um, is what happens after k months. And af so after k months, so we start at zero months with these numbers, we calculate out the coefficients a1, a2 using linear algebra to figure out how to express, how to break that vector up x up into a, a y1 part and a y2 part. Um, then we would say, well, then what happens k months later is we do k times our linear transformation of, the, of our data vector, and we get uh, that linear transformation then simply, uh, simply applied that number of times to these guys. And we know what it does to each of them. Um, the, uh, we said that this was had an eigenvalue of, um, of 1.02. Uh, so this is going to be a1 1.02 k times over applied to y1. Because every time a hits y1, it multiplies by 0 .02, 1.02. .02, so k times, it'll do it k times. And similarly, k times, it'll hit this guy and multiply by 0.58 to the k, y2. So we know exactly what happens forever. Once we can calculate out these a1 and a2 coefficients for a given input vector of owls and rats, you know initially what the owls and rat numbers are, you plug that in, you calculate out a1 and a2, they come out here, and you just get this expression for what happens over time. This component of the story um, stays approximately the same, increasing by about 2% every month, this one dies off, and so if we send k to become very, very large, 0.58 to the k is smaller than 1, it becomes very, very small, and so this disappears, and so we get approximately um, approximate uh, 1.02, uh, so 2% uh, growth per month after long periods of time. So after you wait long enough, no matter how much and in, what initial data of owls and rats you start with, you'd expect pretty much that unless you happen to exactly hit a multiple of y2 as, their, as your capital X initial values, anything else you'd expect eventually to behave like 2% growth. Um, so that's an interesting result because we found that without really knowing a lot about the structure of the system. We just found that if we could measure over time that the new quantities related to the old ones by some simple simple matrix A, then uh, the eigenvector with the biggest eigenvalues, the one that dominates, the others are effectively much smaller and can be ignored, and the dynamics in the long run depends only on that. Um, and we can see the eigenvalue telling us what the growth is, and the eigenvector telling us in which direction it grows in the in the in the, the plane. There's some y1 direction; and it keeps going that way. So it gives us a, a clear geometric picture of when a way to effectively calculate this notion of eigenvalues and eigenvectors to calculate the long-term dynamics of of a simple linear dynamical system. So we've applied the notion of eigenvalue and eigenvector to the study of predator-prey models to show that we can essentially solve them effectively using the notion of eigenvalue and eigenvector, at least for linear predator-prey models. In the next lecture, we want to think about systems of first-order differential equations arising from electric circuits and think about how we can use eigenvalues and eigenvectors there as well.